Okay, so hey guys, we're gonna try something a little bit different here. We're gonna try to actually do some reaction videos um, on different topics from alternate history to Hoi Force stuff to whatever videos we find. You guys are always asking me to watch this video, watch this video, watch this video, literally watch this video video, <laughs> but whatever. Um, so I thought that, hey, maybe why not? I'll just make a YouTube video where I can watch the video. You can see my full reaction. We'll go from there. I've decided to keep this off stream because I think I'll maybe be able to focus more on the video. But if you guys want me to do this on stream so I could have the chat in the bottom right, um, leave a comment and say, yes, this is what we could approve, right? Maybe you wanted me to do this online. We'll see. Uh, don't forget to smash that like button, hit comment and subscribe and all that good stuff. But uh, without further ado, let's get right into the video. I'm half Canadian and I partially grew I'm up fully there. Canadian. Hearing Americans talk about the country always left me conflicted. Until a couple years ago, Americans and Europeans, largely of a left-leaning persuasion, treated Canada as if it was a land of milk and honey. Some left-wing post-racial paradise. However, I knew that wasn't true. Now Canadians and Americans, more on the right, treat Canada like some horrifying Maoist state, which also isn't true. With... Okay, just two very quick comments, and, and I'm not going to be pausing every 10 seconds to do this, or else this will be forever, but yeah, he's 100% correct, and this is my own experience too. I also had this experience when I uh, was in the Nordic countries, when I was in Finland, where everyone in North America thinks that Sweden and Norway and Finland are the land of paradise, and nothing goes wrong there. Um, and when you go to Finland and you actually talk to people that couldn't be further from the truth, right? Every country has their problems. They just have different ones and some are in varying scale to others. So I can very much relate to that. This whole business with the truckers and its reaction to the COVID pandemic in general, we see the tension that have existed in Canada the whole time. Thus, True. I think it's timely True. to talk about a potential future We're not a perfect that Americans country. and Canadians rarely think about. That the chances are very good that Canada won't survive the next few decades. This is a video to talk about the future of Canada and the paths that could result in that nation's end. Two decades? All right. Well, I guess I'm fucked. <laughs> I guess I'll have to get Austrian citizenship. Canada is often overlooked as a nation, but the country is a pretty solid secondary power that's been involved in several major events throughout history, many of which you can see in the Magellan documentary series, Canada, the Story of Us. This documentary goes over the history of Canada from its birth as a collection of British colonies to its involvement in modern events like World War II and the Cold War. Watching this series can give insights into some of the issues Canada faces today, as well as shed light on what they've contributed to many of the great events in world history, such as the World Wars. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service made by filmmakers of the best selection of historical documentaries Was and that? movies out there. They have content covering everything from nice. the world to current events nice. and through crime to astronomy. That Magellan was is compatible oh, with just about any device and is 4K. That was beautiful. No additional cost. Look at that. It's that was so smooth. I absolutely love Magellan. I wish I could get that smooth one day. And cultural documentaries they offer. Covering such a wide variety of topics, Magellan is something for All right. All right. All right. All right. Let's skip ahead a little. Part 1: The Canadian System. Most international so left-wingers treat Canada as some paradise of left-wing <laughs> politics. I like how we use the election from 2011 that the Conservatives absolutely swept in, and you can see that the Liberals got destroyed. The Liberals are otherwise known as the Natural Governing Party of Canada, which is a term that they made up to make them sound more important. Um, and I like how we used this map specifically because most of our elections do not look like this. They look, uh, they look quite a bit different with much more uh, liberal seats. I think this was like the worst result the Liberal Party ever had since the 1920s or something. It really doesn't exist. Canada is a nation like any others with skeletons, problems, and political compromises. Yep. In order to understand how Canada could possibly fall apart, we need to look at Canada's fundamental problems and positions as a nation and how Canada as of now is run. In order to see Canada as it really is, not as it would like to be seen, we need to understand three fundamental political truths of Canada. Mm -hmm. The first is its similarity to the United States. Yes. Anglo-Canada yes. is an extension of the United States. 
After the American Revolution, the Loyalists who didn't like the Revolution immigrated to Canada. Most of the Loyalists came from the middle states like Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey, giving much of Anglo-Canada a culture similar to those states. The cultural similarities between Canada and the United States are beyond <laughs> Canadians talk okay. the same, eat All the right. same food, go to the same churches, watch the same movies, and the list goes on endlessly. Each Canadian province has more in common with the American state opposing it than with the other provinces, or even regional differences inside America. I'm... Okay, I think one of the, the interesting thing. Oh, there you go. There's Finnish Scandinavians, as we were just talking about. I think one of the main things, though, is that, that, that sort of pokes a hole in that is the French Canadians. Perhaps maybe there is more of a French Canadian culture in somewhere like Maine. French culture, sorry, not French Canadian. Um, yeah, okay. Interesting, but I don't know if I totally agree, but I, I get what he's saying. Yeah, definitely, and he's definitely right that America, sorry, the Canadians are way more similar to Americans than we are Europeans or something like this. I mean, genetically, Anglo-Canadians are an extension of the northern United States, while American Southerners could count as a separate ethnic group. As an example, the area of Canada I lived in, southern Ontario, was hey, settled that's from the area in America I'm from. That's probably Pennsylvania. Kitchener. And so I would see many of the same street names and architecture in both places. Their cultural similarities to America have created one of the major crises in Canadian identity, of how to differentiate it from the United States. Before 1960, <laughs> this was largely done through Canada's Britishness. However, after the 1960s, as the Quebecois merged into greater political consciousness, yes. Canadians needed to find a new way to justify their identity. Now, it's that they're the better left-wing alternative to America. Canada is an incredibly bizarre country in that its nationalists are urban and left-wing rather than the and conservative like <laughs> most countries. Okay. Which brings us to the second main geopolitical problem in Canada, the geographic differences inside Canada. Yes. 90% of Canadians live within 100 miles of the U.S. border. Wow. And Canada is a long I didn't know. I didn't know it was 90%. I thought it was closer to like 70. But yeah, so much of our geography, I mean, our country is just, it's just ginormous, right? It's one of the uh, disadvantages of our nation is just how large it is. It's huge. It makes constructing a centralized national core impossible. Each Canadian province has very different cultures and interests. For a brief summary from west to east, British Columbia is like California, <laughs> Alberta is like Texas, okay. Manitoba and Saskatchewan are like Nebraska. <laughs> I like how it says Dakota, Quebec is Quebec. Ontario is like New York or Ohio. Quebec is well. Quebec, and the maritime provinces are like New England. Meanwhile, the northern areas like Yukon or Nunavut are extremely lightly populated, often inhabited by indigenous tribes. Canada is divided geographically between the massive rocky mountains splitting British Columbia, the Canadian Shield or a massive rocky wasteland splitting the plains from Ontario, and a bunch of uninhabited forests splitting the maritimes off. However, for a simple definition, Canada is split geographically east and west by the Canadian Shield. Yeah, Quebec true. is the third major problem true. in Canada in that one quarter of Canada's population. Yeah, it's kind of interesting actually that we don't have, like we don't, we have an east versus east versus west, so to say, but we don't consider a, a south, a southern Canada. But as he just described, it's probably because so many people live in the south, right? We do have the north. Um, that's kind of interesting though that someone from say Edmonton doesn't look at someone from Toronto and say, oh, he's from the South, right? It's always on this East-West divide. It's kind of interesting. Population is French speaking. Another important thing is that outside Quebec, there's very little intermingling between French and English speakers. Living mm, in Ontario, yeah. I've only ever seen one French speaker outside Quebec. The vast majority of Anglo-Canadians okay. speak no French. The Quebecois yes. are very much a separate nation and they act like it. The Quebecois are very nationalist, partially due to centuries of oppression at the hands of English speakers, demand various concessions from the Anglo government. I think I know how Canada's going to fall apart like in this French video. Be the only official language in it's Quebec, like a wild or demanding guess French be used across the whole country, even in areas where there are basically no French speakers. Quebec has threatened independence multiple times, getting remarkably close to achieving it in the 1960s, 80s, and 90s. One of the few things non-Canadians know is that Canada has come inches from civil wars multiple times in the 20th century. What happened is that the central Canadian government has basically bribed Quebec to stay in the country, <laughs> giving it large payments from yes. the rest of the nation. The combination. Also, I liked how that, that image that he used here was actually from Premier Scott Moe, who is a, uh, the Premier of, of Saskatchewan. Kind of funny. 
to Quebec to stay in the country, giving it large payments from the rest of the country. Yeah, share if you the think we need to. The combination of the Quebec yeah, difficulties okay. and the geographic differences means that Canada is a collection of loose alliances that keeps the nation together. Some examples are how Alberta and Quebec are allied against Ontario, or Ontario and Quebec are allied against the West. These alliances are more vital than you'd probably think. Uh, With the 1980, when Quebec nearly seceded, the Plains provinces said that they'd rather join America than stay in a country ruled by Ontario. The Quebec difficulties and papered over with the Laurentian alliance. Okay, I'd kind of like to see who said that, because to just say they, whom, specifically, but okay. Alliance kind of developed in the 1980s and 90s that was pioneered by the elder Trudeau or Justin Trudeau's father. This was effectively an alliance of Ontario yes. and Quebec with the Maritimes as attaches against Western Canada. Those two provinces have over half of Canada's population. Yep. Both Ontario, or more properly Toronto and its suburbs, as well as Quebec... You know he's not from Toronto because he said Toronto and not Toronto, so very important. ...are socially liberal and formed a coalition against the more conservative West. Meanwhile, the Maritimes are poor and deindustrialized and are kept part of the coalition through welfare payments. I'm oversimplifying <laughs> here. The social and economic divide wow. between East okay. and West Canada yes. stood since Definitely. the mid-19th century and has been marred by long-standing bitterness and dislike inside the relationship that's bordered on colonial between the more populated industrial East and the resource-producing West. As mentioned before as well, this is compounded by the natural geographic split between the two regions. When we look at the ruling Canadian clique and classes, we see the effects of the Laurentian Compromise. The alliances of left-wing regions has kept Canadian politics to the left of the United States, with the Conservative mm, yeah, Party true, very true. moderate by the standards of the U.S. Yeah, Republican absolutely. Party, For even sure. to the left of the average Canadian Conservative voter since the national consensus is left-wing. When you look at the bulwark of the Liberal Party, it's a left-wing suburban and urban demographic cluster around cities like Montreal, Toronto, or Vancouver. The yep. Canadian Liberal Party has been able to maintain its power even after horribly embarrassing events, since this core demographic is the same one as Canadian nationalism, really? and to vote yeah. conservative would be a betrayal of Canada's left-wing mission. An important point to consider is that both American and Canadian nationalism are fundamentally middle-class movements. However, due to the very different foundations of both countries, with the conservative loyalists making Canada and the radical at the time rebels in America making that country, it's resulted in American nationalism being fundamentally right-wing and built around liberty, while Canadian nationalism is fundamentally left-wing and built around order. Thus, when you look at Canadian yes, nationalists yeah, and true. the ruling elite do stuff, they often do things that, from an American perspective, look like destroying freedoms. How okay, so this was specifically from the trucker protest, but what he's saying overall, there's a really great video from a YouTuber named J.J. McCullough, who is a, 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 he was a former political commentator who's out of uh, BC. And he has a great video, I think it's called Canadian left-wing nationalism. And he really goes into detail about this, um, that Canada is sort of founded on this anti-Americanism due to our history, right? Due to our connection um, being a former British colony. Um, so nationalism in the way um, is people that say they're they're staunchly proud of our health care. Um, not like the Yanks was a very old saying that my grandfather used to say. Um, and just being overall anti-American. Whoa, look at those crazy conservatives down there um, in the USA. And uh, we're so much better than the USA. And this is what you hear all the time, all the time as a Canadian is this really profound anti-Americanism um, and unlike <clears throat> sort of more recent social movements that anti XYZ whatever is typically out of favor um, anti-Americanism is, is just really really strong um, in Canada it's it's possibly <laughs> arguably one of the things that keeps us all together is that oh at least we're not like America right or so the saying goes although I really think that is unfair um, it's sort of our, yeah, it's maybe our phrase that every Canadian can maybe relate to. However, from a Canadian perspective, which is more in line with Europe, they're trying to install order and regain social control and cohesion. 
when we look at Trudeau's reaction to the... It really needs to, like, the mic thing going back and forth. ...truckers protesting the vaccine mandate for their profession, involving breaking many legal freedoms, like freezing their bank accounts, calling the <laughs> state of emergency to drive them out, or trying to destroy their camp. You're spicy. watching a symbolic this representation of the Laurentian liberal elite undemocratically trying to hold power of the conservative West, where the trucker movement started. That's a very hot take, and I don't want to. I don't want to make this about specifically about you know modern left right politics. I'm more interested in the sort of founding of the nation and our history, um, but not to get not to get too into the the spicy political takes. But uh, that was a recent event that happened in Canada. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it. It was it made international news. I even heard about. I actually read about it in an Austrian newspaper here. Um, so yeah, what what he said there at the end is. I think more opinion that some people see it, um, but it's definitely a viewpoint that's out there. I think the present moment where the left-wing Trudeau administration is dishonoring itself is the perfect vantage point to view the further decline of the Canadian order. For people who haven't been banging that's a hell of a statement. the Canadian left has been horribly abusing its power over the last few years. Some examples of this involve throwing the leader of a major right-wing opposition party in jail for being maskless in an outdoor political rally. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. <laughs> you can't blame that on the Liberal Party. That was the RCMP who arrested them, and... All right, this is getting, actually, you know what, after I said that, I'm like, okay, this is getting way too much into modern politics. That's, I think that's a bit of a, of an unfair painting of the situation is to blame it on um, the current liberal government that we have in, in Canada, but okay. Is that if you're entering Canada and they don't like your quarantine plan for whatever reason, the border officers could put you in a literal government camp without a trial. The Canadian Parliament passed a bill making it illegal to not use someone's oh preferred boy. pronouns, and they tried to pass a bill to hurt freedom of speech. This is getting so members. spicy. The government so kept Canada spicy. under quarantine and lockdown while over 70% of the population was vaccinated. This doesn't even include the previous corruption and uh, abuses yes. seen among the liberal elite mm -hmm. beforehand like the Lavalin scandal and the W.E. Yeah, charity. Yeah, the SC Lavalin. Yeah. Alternatively, how a prime minister obsessed with political correctness is a history of doing blackface and other similar <laughs> cultural misappropriations. Yes, Speaking that of is that, true. political correctness is much worse in Canada than the United States, mostly focusing upon indigenous issues. At the turn of the 20th century, Canada had a policy of forcibly placing indigenous children in government schools to assimilate them. Mm -hmm. When one of these schools was discovered and found, it created an immense national mourning, with city bells tolling, schools commemorating the event, etc., before the case was even investigated. The irony here is that Canada had by far the best relations with indigenous peoples of any nation in the New World. There was only one Indian war in Canadian history, and the colonization process was mostly peaceful. In a country like the United States with its history of breaking Indian treaties and straight-up genocide, this self-flagellation would be a lot better placed. As an immense irony, I remember my sister's college of University of Toronto, arguably Canada's best university, He's not from Toronto. made a whole thing of honoring like the Haudenosaunee as the true owners of Toronto at every public event. The truth is that the Huron are the original inhabitants of Toronto, and the Haudenosaunee, better known as the Iroquois, drove them out and committed genocide against them during the Beaver Wars in the late 17th century. Meanwhile, the British colonization of the region was mostly peaceful and done by treaty, with the Iroquois as their allies. Okay, so my mic fell over while I was explaining this, so this is sort of a recut. Sorry about that, I wanted to do this on one take. But basically, to sum up what he's saying, this is, this is a very... This is a very, very topical issue in Canadian politics right now. And what he's saying about the, uni about the university and the land declarations, I can comment on. I can't comment on whether on the Iroquois and, and the driving the Huron out in the 1700s. Unfortunately, I just don't know enough about that. Um, but uh, the university that I went to, Ryerson University, they used to do these land declarations saying that we're on stolen land and this is the original land of of the uh i think it's the medicine spoon tribe and if memory serves me that's mississauga um and these land declarations i think have gotten a little can be a little extreme at times because yes okay while you acknowledged it and i'm sure it's in good faith that you tried to do it it doesn't you know it doesn't do anything if you want to give back the stolen land so to say why did you build a university on it where you make on where you make hundreds of millions of dollars a year and while there is programs for indigenous people to go to school um, i believe free of charge 
in Canada, um, post-secondary school, of course, um, I think that the sort of land declarations, it's, it's sort of like, well, I've made the land declaration, but I'm still sitting on this land. I'm not giving it back, right? And so it's a very contentious political issue. Um, but yeah, he's, he's definitely, he's really hitting the, the nail on the head here. He really, really knows what he's, uh, what he's talking about for this. Strange postmodern cultural consensus. Take the wet. All right, I already know this guy loves Jordan Peterson. The wet den pipeline is a keystone example in which the democratically elected tribal leaders of that nation voted to allow the uh, pipeline, but then protesters tried to shut it down with the argument that the true representatives of the Wet'suwet'en nation were the hereditary tribal chiefs, with the democratic institutions being part of the settler nature of Canada and thus illegitimate. The historic irony being that chiefs were also formally created by European colonization, and there really wasn't a formalized government before white colonialism. A consensus among the modern Canadian ruling class is that tribal peoples can act as they wish, independent of the central Canadian government's law, due to Canada itself being an illegitimate creation of conquest. Just Okay. 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 All right. I was not expecting this video to go this way. <laughs> I was really not expecting it to go this way and take on the spiciest of, pol of Canadian political hot takes of the day. Um... So what he's talking about comes from the Indian Act. And the Indian Act, this is something that, again, I'm not, I am not a lawyer, right? I'm not the most well-versed in the Indian Act. However, this was something that was heavily debated back in, I believe, 1980, I want to say, which was Pierre Trudeau, so Justin Trudeau's father. Um, there's a lot of positives that come with the Indian Act. However, there are a lot of negatives as well. And what he pointed out, um, talking about how they can sort of act, if you will, outside of the reign of the central Canadian government is one of the ways that people look at the Indian Act negatively, right? Some people look at it positive in that manner to say, look, exactly as he pointed out, right? It was initially theirs and this is sort of the consensus. But then the negative is, is that, um, you know, exactly as he said, they're acting without it. So it really depends on which side you're on. But I think more debate around the Indian Act is actually uh, needed modernly, especially with some of the, uh, the the spicy takes that are coming up in this video. Justin Trudeau and his clique have made statements along the lines that Canada has no national identity, that Canadian Which values stupid, do not exist, way. and that Canada must keep taking new immigration. They believe. All right, super spicy there. Sorry to pause again, but. I think what Trudeau said is obviously stupid. Of course, Canadian Canada has a, has a value, but in regards to immigration, it's like, eh, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to get into, I'm not going to get into immigration, but let's go from here. It's been a sort of post also, this is 2006, so this is really old data. Most modernist state beyond ethnicity, that which has no parallel across all of history, and has only its closest parallels in giant empires run by coherent and oppressive elites like Austro-Hungary or the Mughal. That's probably since the Canadian political elite must be bilingual by law, a group that's less than 20% of Canada's population, and must be comfortable in both French and Anglo-Saxon culture. A good friend of mine is... There you go, I was just talking to him. Bilingual by law? And what does he mean by cultural elite? So, for example, if you want to be an MP, which is a member of parliament, you do not need to speak French. However, and this guy, J.J. McCauley, is rather against the idea of having French be necessary for the Canadian government. So we have our new governor general who was chosen by the Trudeau administration and she does not speak French. And this was a this is a big point of current controversy um, and which side you stick on that. For me, I don't think it's a big issue. I don't think every should uh, every government official should be speaking should have to speak French. However, I do understand the, the Quebecois side of it too. Probably the most important Canadian political YouTuber, JJ McCullough, yeah, who helped me write this episode, and he made a video about how Canada has failed in that Canada has had three goals across its history of keeping the French in, the Americans out, and the Indians down. Yep. However, that Canada has failed at all three and is now losing its identity. The radicalism of the Canadian elite makes sense through this prism, given that elites that have a weak right to rule often act arbitrarily and abusively to hold on to their power.
This perspective highlights the postmodernism of the Canadian ruling class, given that relying on any of Canada's national identities, rather than pitting them against each other to maintain balance of power, results in Canada's collapse. The endpoint of Anglo-Canadian nationalism is joining the U.S., and French-Canadian nationalism <laughs> is Quebec gaining independence, which would result in the end of a coherent Canada. I think the reason they're emphasizing native nationalism to the degree they are is that it's a movement that, due to the tiny amount of natives in Canada, at less than 5% of the population, that can yeah, be easily so. co-opted. If 95% of Canadians are alienated from their identities, and that 5% is bought off as part of the ruling coalition, then Canada needs its ruling class. Okay, first off, first off, no, <laughs> I think that's a pretty unconvincing argument that the English speaking part of Canada, which as you can see by this graph is the majority of Canada, is just going to break off and join the United States. And it's interesting that he said that because he said so much of our national history is funded, is founded, sorry, in anti-Americanism and yet then goes to say, oh, okay, well then they'll just join the US anyways, right? So it's a bit of a contradiction to me. Um, and then what would Quebec do become its own nation, I suppose? Uh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm not, I'm really not quite convinced by the arguments he's making. I understand it, but it, it seems a little, it doesn't seem very well thought out in my opinion. It just seems like, oh, here's all the spiciest takes of the day, right? Here's all the hot political controversies, as if there weren't hot political controversies three, three, uh, 30 years ago that means that Canada is going to fail in two decades. It's like, and join America. Okay. Uh, I'm not so convinced, but sure. If 95% of Canadians are alienated from their identities, nah, well, and that I'll, 5% I'll that. is bought off as part seconds. of the ruling coalition, then Canada needs its ruling class. What I'm trying to say here is that the current compromise and group who runs Canada are losing their legitimacy through corruption. In my video on social justice, I came to the conclusion that the okay, movement would yeah. self-destruct over the next few decades. And this process would also occur in Canada with their left. But the problem is that their left is the force that holds their country together. I feel kind of silly. Also, just very quickly, I hate the political compass. It's got to be one of the worst measurements for, for politics, but okay. Billy saying the Canadian elite's abusing its power, given that from history's perspective, its flaws appear beyond mild. It's not like British India, which let tens of millions die of famine without lifting a hand, or modern Burma, which is committing genocide against its Rohingya minority, mm. is a military dictatorship and tries to consign other minorities like the Karen and Shan to state-sponsored serfdom. Oh, However, glad recognized the role that. of the state is to serve the nation, and no matter how well-intended the failure is, whether through forcing Confucian values or multiculturalism, if it doesn't align with the nation's interest, it still fails. As my friend JJ said, a polite, clean, and friendly Canadian totalitarianism is still a totalitarianism. Another important factor that I've almost never seen talked about is Canada's recent good fortune, or how it hasn't fallen to populism like the United States or Europe, is that Yet. people act like it's some inherent good nature of the Canadian people. Yeah. The truth is that Canada's political stability is caused more by high resource prices. Canada is at heart a colonial economy, and that its economy is in many ways driven by selling resources to the rest of the world. To their good luck, the last few decades have seen massive economic growth in the developing world that have kept resource prices high. We sure. see similar trends occurring in Latin America, Australia, and New Zealand with high resource prices. Yep. In Europe and America now, a big driver behind the current social problems is deindustrialization. In the resource producing countries, it's largely been by the downturn of prices driven by China's economic slowdown. This was largely manifested in Canada, Latin America, and Australia by growing big government leftist power, as people turned to the left to keep giving out money so that people could maintain the standards of living they had when resource prices were higher. The later start for Canadian political populism explains why Canada's anti-immigrant backlash hasn't happened yet while nativist parties happened earlier in the US and Europe. Having lived in both countries, the idea that Canadians are inherently more tolerant or open-minded than Americans just isn't true. In Canada, the pie was growing for longer, so immigrants weren't seen as infringing on local resources. However, I don't see any... You know, this video is already getting long enough, so I, I'm not going to totally comment on this, but what does authoritarian populist views mean? I mean, it is just the chart. You can't, you can't read the questionnaire, but 
63% for France, 50% for Finland. Uh, okay. Going for longer. So immigrants or that immigration doesn't become a major political issue in Canada. Okay. For example, the greater Toronto fair. area is majority immigrant and Vancouver's 40%. Yeah. However, as my predictions have laid out, it seems likely that the world economy and political system is going to see troubles over the next few decades that will depress the world economy and probably resource prices at some point. The only exception would be a world war that would shoot resource prices through the roof. Well, then another world war, that would be okay, pretty much the end of the world. Okay, now let's imagine a so. Canada where the current left-wing leadership has discredited itself through continuing its corrupt and immoral ways. This Canada is... Another thing that I don't understand, he says, okay, the left-wing leadership has corrupted itself uh, through all these immoral ways, but then we live in a liberal democracy, so just vote for the other party, right? Uh, I mean, this is what I don't understand here. Like... He's saying this as if Justin Trudeau is going to forever be elected, right? Eventually he will lose in an election or he will resign or some other liberal candidate. Like the Conservative Party will be in power eventually, right? It may even be in 2020, uh, 2024, right? 2023, I don't remember off the top of my head. So, okay, right? Like I just don't really see the connection here. It seems like a very, very weak uh, connection that the... That the disintegration, the fall of Canada, the fall, will be because of spicy, you know, right wing takes on 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 what what he sees as sort of the woke left or the political left, right? It's very it's very culture warry, right? It's it's okay. Has seen a strong populist right akin to Trump or Marine Le Pen arise with a powerful nativist agenda. The leadership of the Canadian Conservative okay, Party I think I spoke is moderate soon. and centrist to a fault, not being able to garner any dynamism. As an example of this future trend, just look at how the Conservatives removed Aaron O'Toole for being too boring, for lack of a better term. The thing to consider about Canada is that it will splinter without too much strain put on it. I mean, the 20th century was a very easy century for Canada, all things considered, and Quebec nearly split off several times. However, demo So that makes it not an easy century? Anyways. Demographic factors are going to make this a harder century for Canada. Now is the part of the video where I inevitably talk about demographics. Canadian demographics are very stark in that the East is very old and getting older, with Eastern True. Canada having birth rates and average ages at the same range as Western Europe. True. Western Canada, meanwhile, is the youngest area in the Western world with a growing population. As I've said countless times before in this channel, demographics drives politics and countries with collapsing populations of horrible futures. Yep. A nation with an aging population doesn't have money to start new businesses, wage wars, or birth children, oh, ending up in a consuming black hole. <laughs> We're already seeing the start of this trend in Japan today. Already today, the wealthier and growing Western Canada sends Eastern Canada money and subsidies. This will only get worse, and as it does, along through the stark political difference, in which in many places in the Prairie Provinces the Conservatives get 98% of the vote, will get worse. Alberta is a major oil-producing province, and their main market is the United States. An interesting story I like to tell is the Standing Rock Pipeline, in which the Albertans were mm. in a trade war with their rival British Columbia, and so couldn't get True. their oil to the Pacific, and so tried to route it through the Texas oil fields. Yeah. However, since the land passed through a region ceded by the Lakota in North Dakota in 1876, it became a symbolic issue for the American left, which prevented its creation. There are a couple different historic cycles that work largely through demographic and economic trends and are extremely complicated to predict, but both the Turchin and Strauss House cycles predict the U.S. will have a golden age towards the middle of the century. Whenever the U.S. has faced golden ages, it's expanded geographically, okay, sure. whether in the early 19th century or in the 1940s, and so annexing more territory wouldn't be out of character. The U.S. is a young country and won't face the same aging crises as the rest of the world, and this would come at the same time as Eastern Canada's aging and economic collapses. A big reason Canadians are averse to joining America now is that the U.S. is a dysfunctional mess, but if the U.S. was in golden age, it would make sense for the Prairie Provinces okay. to join the U.S. that shares their more conservative values uh, and is also their okay. biggest oil and grain market. They'd probably join America since... Uh, so I like how it says here, Manitona. He spelled Manit... It's spelled Manitoba wrong, but whatever. Are you think the U.S.? All right, here, you guys can, can debate this one. Do you think the U.S. would just willingly accept three Canadian provinces to be the 51st, 2nd, and 3rd state? Yeah. 
I don't know. I wouldn't be so sure, but okay. As independent nations, they would totally be at the mercy of negotiations with the Americans, but as parts of America, they would get better deals for their resources. This is one option. The other is that by this point, the Canadian project is facing so much stress that Quebec would secede. However, both results would effectively result in the tapestry of alliances and special interests that is Canada falling apart. Once the planes would join the US, British Columbia would be isolated from the rest of Canada, thus resulting in it becoming independent. British Columbia is extremely left-wing, likely being the most left-wing region of the North American continent, with socialists regularly in charge, and so joining America would be- uh, And this is, this, is, this is why it's just spicy hot takes, because British Columbia is not the most leftist, right? It's, if you look at how they vote provincially, I mean, the Liberal Party in BC is far more conservative than any other Liberal Party in, in any of the provinces, right? And, and so to say they're run by socialists, it's just, uh, uh, okay. Politically too jarring. It would work out for them anyway, since politically, economically, and culturally, they're oriented towards Asia, with Vancouver being 40% Asian and yeah, much of their trade sure. coming from Asia. Vancouver, with the rest of British Columbia as an extension, would do fine as a city-state. Meanwhile, on the other side of Canada, with Quebec gone, the Maritimes would be isolated from the rest of Canada. The Maritimes are left-wing, but don't have the immense pride of British Columbia or Ontario that would make <laughs> annexation by the U.S. impossible. Also, they don't have a tremendous amount of trade connection what? with America either. I could either see them becoming independent, like, part of Ontario, part of an right, Ontario-based nation, or joining the U.S., with the last being possible if the U.S. is in a golden age. And that all leaves Ontario, who would probably keep the various Arctic territories, with the exception of the Yukon that would probably join the U.S. for ease of connection to Alaska. Ontario is the seat of Canadian left-wing nationalism, and so would be unable to join the U.S. out of pride. However, Ontario's geography in the center of the continent lends itself well to the situation of being part and yet not part of the American system. Like many micro-European nations, it could structure its economy around providing services that the U.S. wouldn't like, like certain drugs, low taxes, manufacturing, or the like. However, an important thing to consider is that even though places like Ontario, <laughs> Quebec, or British Columbia might be technically independent, they'd be so economically, politically, and militarily This is the American dream, isn't the it, guys? That in real terms, there's no way they could be anything except puppet states. To take a bird's eye view, Canada almost certainly won't survive the next few centuries without annexation by the U.S. Oh, so now it's the next few it has centuries. None of the factors that keep countries alive. Whether he said two decades. Their strong geography, national identity, a warlike tradition, or importance to the international balance of power. The only thing that has prevented Canada's annexation by the U.S. in real terms to be brutally harsh is entropy. For clarification, this is a scenario that could play out. I don't know if it will, or even if it's the most likely option. Yeah, For all its okay. feelings, Canada is still one of the most stable countries in the world in a very safe neighborhood, and so I think the chances it makes it to the 22nd century are pretty good. However, I wanted to explore what? this scenario that I don't see many other people cover. What if all and thanks okay. for watching. If okay. you enjoyed that okay. video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stick. Okay, so to wrap this up, because this is now going to be a 35 minute video, which I did not expect. Um, I liked the video. I thought it was interesting. Uh, I think that a lot of the, the hot takes and the sort of spicy news of the day to sort of try and weave an argument of how Canada will fall is was a little it was a little weak in the arguments. Um, however, a lot of the facts that he listed and which the ones that I commented on are definitely true. So he certainly knows what he's talking about. But then it's sort of in the end there where he said, "Well, they're they're probably going to make it anyways. It's pretty stable. You know, I can see it last in the next century." Whereas in the beginning, he said it's not going to last two decades. Okay. Anyways, so that was the video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Please let me know in the comments uh, what you liked, what you disliked, and then we can argue more about Canada. And also let me know if you think I should do this on stream. So yeah, that was fun. Hope you enjoyed. Till the next one. Bye.